Daniel Grant. Uh, this is my partner, Danilo. And on the phone with us is Carlicia. We are part of a DDC where we will be presenting our offering for a uh, office building and retail building at the site of Los Olds View, uh, which is at 421 Southeast 2nd Street in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So uh, this site is about uh, 1.55 acres. Uh, it's in between uh, Browder Boulevard and Southeast Second Street, which is in uh, uh, in the Recreational Activity Center uh, District of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, this area is I've seen a uh, seen uh, a lot of new activity in terms of uh, construction buildings in terms of what's there. In that area, you have uh, the Bank of America Plaza, which is uh, one of the highest valued buildings uh, within Fort Lauderdale area. And from what we've gathered, uh, from what you said about this uh, site location, what is offered, you said that there is uh, it's a very uh, prime location uh, in terms of what the market offers. Uh, you have uh, access to uh, I-95, I-595 uh, in terms of uh, uh, modes of transportation. Is, uh, you have uh, multiple uh, options of getting around uh, through uh, bike lanes which are being uh, implemented and developed. You also have uh, the new Pride Line which is uh, roughly 500 meters from the property location uh, which will provide access to uh, destinations like West Palm Beach and Miami within 30 minutes uh, on a daily basis. And in the future, you'll be able to access to Orlando. So in terms of accessibility, uh, it's really remarkable. And in the future, the city of Fort Lauderdale is also looking to implement a new uh, street car system called the, uh, the WAVE. Uh, so in terms of what the city offers, it's uh, uh, remarkable what uh, tenants and users of the building will be able to utilize in the near future. Okay, in terms of so conditions, as I mentioned before, it's a uh, one point five five acres. It's uh, right next to one financial plaza, uh, to the north, north of the building, uh, of the property. We have uh, services, uh, uh, utility services, internet, water, uh, electricity. Uh, no major slopage on the site. The uh, slope uh, will provide eventually uh, the Souls and hydrology testing. Uh, in terms of the zoning and land use, so as I mentioned before, this is uh, what the city of Fort Lauderdale has designated this district where uh, Los Olas View is located. It's within the uh, RAC CC, which is uh, listed as the Recreational Activities uh, Center. Uh, uh, city center. So this is where there are very few uh, or limited restrictions on what can be built on site in terms of commercial, uh, residential. In this case, you can, uh, there is no density requirements uh, listed, nor are there any height restrictions. What does come into play though is uh, the, F the FAA, what the height restrictions I mean, there are uh, restrictions what can be placed on the site, uh, approved by the city's uh, design review committee. Uh, the previous owners have been approved uh, through a plot amendment uh, back in December 2014, where uh, the property 
uh, can build uh, one of the following uh, options. It can uh, build up to 425 high-rise units for a residential building. You can build either a 425,500 square foot office building, 45,850 square feet for uh, retail uh, usage, a parking facility, or a standalone bank with or without a uh, drive-in facility. In addition uh, to the plat amendment, there are uh, restrictions on what the maximum floor plate size can be. In this case, because there are 425 units, which adds up to about 40 plus uh, stories, uh, 42 stories. That means that the maximum floor plate size for that tower portion of the property can be uh, up to 12,500 square feet for each floor. In terms of uh, market analysis in this area, now the vacancy rate for the Fort Lauderdale area uh, in the third quarter was listed at 10.1%, uh, a decrease from the previous year of 10.4%. And when I say the vacancy rate, this is for the uh, office uh, the, uh, office market uh, in general, whereas uh, the Pendulum uh, would consider building for an office building would be a Class A building, uh, which is currently listed at 13% of the vacancy rate. All right. So when we um, when we're looking at the uh, the feasibility of building uh, something on that site, uh, doing a development on that site, we looked at basically three. Uh, options. Option number one was the Crocker Tower, which was the original plan uh, that the land owner wanted to develop at that site. Then we also looked at a 425 unit uh, off, um, apartment tower to see if it would, make, if it would make sense. And then finally, we also looked at an office, a mixed use retail office uh, building, as Daniel just said. So when we looked at the original Crocker Tower, which was 396 uh, uh, rental units plus 10,000 square feet of retail space, uh, we uh, reached out to the um, to the broker uh, from uh, Cushman and Wakefield, and he told us that the their estimated construction cost for that was 150 million dollars, including the land. Uh, using those numbers, when uh, we put it into our software analysis, we came to the, um, to the conclusion that the IRR was only the internal rate of return for that project uh, in a best case scenario was 14.46%. Now, um, that is probably one of the reasons because we also asked them why didn't the developer, the owner of the land, decided to go forward with that project and there were two reasons. One reason was that they couldn't get all the equity partners lined up, which kind of makes sense because of the internal rate of return is pretty low uh, for the risk involved. And uh, number two, the owner of the land also is involved in an office project uh, that they can tackle. So perhaps they decided that um, the capture rate, if they were going to do the apartments, was probably too high for, for that area and they decided just to get rid of the land. So that was the uh, what happened with the original Crocker Tower. Then we looked at the 425 unit apartment tower. We analyzed the possibility of developing a larger apartment structure with 425 units, but using kind of the same uh, square foot, a dollar per square foot standard that they were using for, the, for their 396 units. Uh, it came out that the project was gonna be uh, around 175 million dollars, and um, the internal rate of return for that was going to be 13.68. So we're going to run into the same problems as 
the, uh, that Crawford Tower originally ran into, which was that it was not enough of a return there for investments. So then we, we tried the mixed-use retail office tower. And originally, we tried it with the full 425,000 square feet. But when we took into consideration the, um, um, the plat restrictions uh, for the floors, it was going to end up being like a, a 60 story <laughs> building. So that was not a good idea. And uh, we reduced it to 375,000 square feet plus 45,850 uh, square feet of retail use. Now, that, because the construction cost is lower for that type of product than for an apartment building who had that, which has more finishes, then the, um, when we did all the numbers, the internal rate of return for that was 21.81, which is a lot more attractive. So we think that is probably a more viable option. However, um, we also uh, understand that there is a requirement for some kind of zoning variance if we're going to use retail and office at that same building. So uh, there is a caveat that this project uh, is, is uh, feasible money-wise, but it will depend on getting all the approvals from the city of Lauderdale. So if someone is, wants to buy the land there, they need to tie it somehow to getting all the uh, variances and approved, and all the funds approved in order to for that to make sense. Having said that, that was still our best option for the uh, our uh, investor. And now we're going to let Carlicia talk about the, uh, the SWOT analysis and the conclusion. OK, so we had to um, look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats presented with um, possibly acquiring this property. So. Um, we determined that some of the strengths are, of course, the location. It's in a prime uh, location right in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Um, it's within walking distance to, um, you know, Fort Lauderdale nightlife. Um, it's in close proximity to the major interstate. Um, it's also directly north of the Hollywood Airport. Um, let's see. Oh, one of the biggest um, factors is that that site is one of the largest remaining undeveloped single parcels in um, downtown Fort Lauderdale. So that just you know adds to the attractiveness for an investor who may be you know interested in developing on that type of uh, land. Um, as Daniel mentioned, is located in the regional activities city center, um, so it's like one of the most liberal zoning permits that you can obtain. Um, let's see. The average household income in that area within within just a one mile radius is $114,000. And uh, for the um, retail space, it's easy access to the Broward Financial Parking Plaza Garage. Some of the weaknesses are that it's within close proximity of comparable office buildings, um, office buildings, so, you know, that are either completed or close to completion. So because our project hasn't gotten off the ground yet, um, that may present um, an issue as far as um, obtaining tenants. Um, let's see, commercial. So commercial retail uses are not permitted within the office use without the approval of the Board of County Commissioners who shall review and address the uses for um, increased impact. So they have to receive uh, approval first to be able to use this as both a retail and office space. Also, there are office vacancy trends that seem to be increasing based on the market research that we did. So it may indicate an oversupply of inventory. So that's something that we need to be mindful of, that we have to be mindful of. Um, but there are opportunities. Um, the no height restriction 
um, is a plus. So there's a, you can possibly add more floors, those more units, capture more rent. Um, there are future projects that are um, coming into Fort Lauderdale that may uh, benefit the investor and you know the tenants in that area. So there will be a wage streetcar. So that's you know an accessibility benefit. Um, and also there will be a passenger rail service. So there are different modes of transportation that are going to be coming into the area soon, maybe as early as 2017. Um, and also, there has been a recent surge in companies moving their businesses to Fort Lauderdale. So there is a demand for the office space. But again, as we stated in the weaknesses, it could be an oversupply. Possible threats are um, oh, if we're not able to obtain the variance, then the use of the space um, will not be permitted for a retail and office space. Um, let's see. Mm. Okay, so the land, the certain landowners pursuing a uh, nearby office, um, and they are starting development on that. So there's competition within just a half mile radius, which may affect our um, supply and demand. So that is what we have for our SWAT analysis. Okay. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so, we concluded that the site, um, it seems like it may be, it seems like there's some potential there, um, and there will be a reason to uh, just, you know, buy and hold it, but um, since there's further approval that needs to happen from the city officials, there may, you know, be further delays and become a little burdensome. So um, we have decided that we would not, um, that this is not a good investment at the time, but that um, further, just further research should be conducted just to make a I guess final determination, but for right now, it, it wouldn't be an, a site that we would invest in. Questions? Yes, I have some questions. Uh, thank you. So uh, let's go back to uh, Danilo, your part of the presentation. Yes. Um, so you mentioned three alternatives. Um, and calculating your internal rate to return. Yes. You said the construction costs on the first alternative was 150. You came up with a 14 point IRR, 175 on the second alternative, 425 units of apartments, and a 13.86 IRR. What was the construction cost on your mixed use alternative? Uh, it was ni uh, uh, roughly 99 million. I see, okay. And so, now what was the imputed land acquisition cost in each of these scenarios? On the first two, we're going for 12 million. Uh, on the last one, we're gonna bid to the owner seven and a half million. All right, and how did you derive those particular numbers? Um, by talking to the, um, to the broker. The broker said that they did not have a price, but that they had a guidance between 12 and 14 million. And uh, we extrapolated that for the 150 that they had and we kind of uh, made it work since it seemed to us that they're trying to get rid of the site. 
Um, Did you say get rid of? Yes. Is that, that, was that the term that no. Troy Ballard used? No, 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 no. That is no. That is mm, that is just that is my opinion. Right. Most brokers would not use that term. Of course. Right. Okay. Of course. No, no. I'm not saying that he's he used that term. Mm -hmm. I am saying that it seems to me that they try to get the equity. They couldn't pull it off. Mm -hmm. The numbers don't work. Mm -hmm. They have another site. So how did you come up with a seven and a half on the third alternative? Because that's the number that we need to make work the uh, the office file. I see. Okay. So if it doesn't work with that, then it might not be a deal. All right. So so Carlisha, you just mentioned that your team decided that it was not a good investment, but if you made a bid of seven and a half million and you had an IRR of twenty one percent, wouldn't that justify making that bid? Uh, it would seem to be that. You could submit it, and that would make it a good investment. It, it, yes, certainly. Would. So why not bid at that number? <coughs> what do you think, Carlisha? You're still there, right? No, yes, I'm still here. I'm just trying to process your question. That's sure. Well, anybody in the team can answer that, of course. I think Carlisha misread. The conclusion. The, uh, the conclusion says that um, that the site, even though the site is a uh, is a is, is a site that that could be uh, purchased and hold because it's the last remaining site on developed in that area, uh, any kind of development option should be taken with utmost care and uh, and. Uh, yeah, you need to be very careful because not all options are viable or profitable. Um, the recommended retail office tower needs further approval from the city. So assuming that we can get a purchase uh, for the land at that price, seven and a half, and that we can get all the, uh, all the approvals from the city, then it will be a very good investment. So when you look at, if you assume that the seven and a half million dollar number was right, let's just move this uh, analysis forward on the mixed right. use scenario. Did you do that equilibrium analysis to see what the competition was for 375,000 square feet of office? What is the availability? What is the occupancy rate in downtown Fort Lauderdale for Class A office? Uh, in well, uh, the occupancy rate in the Fort Lauderdale area uh, for a Class A office building is around uh, around uh, in the low to low 90s to uh, high 80 percent for occupancy. I see. And uh, in, in your report, do you actually have comps showing uh, what those other what the buildings would be? I guess. Uh, I mean, uh, it would be interesting to see what the comps would be, uh, and maybe you decided there aren't any good comps, or maybe there. Uh, because of that 10 or 11 percent vacancy rate, maybe it doesn't make it a good occupancy, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, investment opportunity. Um, well, so that in uh, in Fort Lauderdale area, that the average was 10 percent uh, for all uh, class office buildings, whereas uh, uh, in down in the downtown Fort Lauderdale area, uh, it is. There is a high uh, vacancy rate. So the data, did you go on to CoStar to look at the yes. um, for both multi uh, and on for? CoStar for their uh, market report, mm -hmm. uh, through uh, the Reese report, yes. Did you find any additional data that Christian and Wakefield provided to you in addition to the offering memorandum? I noticed in the offering memorandum, of course, they provided their own market data. Were you right. able to validate it with CoStar? Uh, that uh, I am not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they so mentioned the class A. Yep, by all means, they ask. mentioned the class A vacancy rate was thirteen percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who mentioned that? So, do you know what uh, actual land acquisition comps are for uh, downtown Fort Lauderdale, whether it's on a per unit basis for multifamily or on a per square foot basis for office. Can you give us some comps? That's one way to validate whether or not the acquisition prices that the broker wishes for the one you mentioned made sense. 
I we didn't use I we didn't we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what we did was the, the the other way around. This is what we need to, in order to make it profitable. This is what we're paying for the land. If it if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Regardless of whatever other people bought it for. Mm -hmm. Doctor, do you have some questions? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So let's just start out with the construction cost for a second. Um, you had said that the first two um, from the residential uses, you've got about 175, 150 million, something right. like that for 400 or so units, which is like $400,000 plus per unit. Um, but then you know you make the statement that the the cost um, for Developing it as office and retail is going to be dramatically less, about 99 million, so a difference of like 75 million dollars. So, first of all, where did you get the information on the the actual construction cost for the different property types? Um, we well, I called uh, a few contractors and asked them what they uh, what what. Uh, Typical cost for finished buildings were in uh, in that. Then compare that to the cost of construction and land that was uh, provided from the developer for the original tower, and, um, and that's how we arrived at about for an apartment building about three hundred seventy-six dollars per square foot, including land. So now. Just to make sure that I'm clear, because it wasn't inherently clear to me. Now, when you say apartments, are we talking condos for sale, or are we talking apartments for rent? Um, well, the, uh, the the Crocker Tower was for rent. Okay. And um, and the uh, the other numbers were given to us based on the height of the building. Okay. So that's how. So was option number two also rental, or was it for sale? It was also rental, yes. Okay. And I guess, you know, what I'm trying to reconcile in my head is the difference, the vast difference of the construction cost for residential that you provided versus the, the cost for office. I mean, to me, $75 million, I mean, almost half the price, right. which seems a bit much of a difference because I mean whenever you're building out residential I mean what's really the difference between residential space and office space I mean what is it that you would be providing in residential space that you're not providing in office um Pretty well, much one thing kitchens kitchens and bathrooms well you select the bathrooms well you, you, may not, you don't have, have the amount of bathrooms that okay, you have but even on a per unit basis what I came up with is you're basically saying that those kitchens and bathrooms per unit are going to be about $175,000 each. That seems a bit excessive for the, the kitchen and bathroom cost. True. So I'm just trying to reconcile in my head what the difference is between the construction cost for an apartment tower versus an office tower. To me, there just seems to be way too much variance there in the, in the, in the construction cost. Yeah, that was, uh, that was something that, um, that I had also in the back of my head uh, as a, a potential flaw, but I couldn't reconcile it at the time. Do you think perhaps that maybe those construction costs, were those actual construction cost numbers or were those potentially value of the project sort of numbers? In other words, completed project value numbers versus construction cost numbers. In other words, adding in your profit from effectively developing it. It could be. It could be. But the uh, the, the, the question that I asked was straightforward. What is the what was the construction cost? Okay. What came back was 150 million, including the land. And I don't know if that answer was padded or had something else in it. Using that as a go by. And um, and then basically the difference was that for 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 um, for office it was about one hundred and fifty dollars per square foot. It was north of three hundred for uh, apartments. 
to me, let me just ask a question while, while you're asking those questions, Doctor. And uh, what rents did you use in your analysis for the apartments? We we were very conservative. Um, we used uh, specifically Amoray and Camden, which was right beside it. Mm -hmm. We came in with uh, we were using two point five. Uh, even though the rents could be higher. Amore is exceeding that by far. Yes, yes. But Amore uh, uh, seems to be uh, a little bit more high-end and they have more penthouse uh, space. Uh, we were not going to have penthouses. And we also wanted to, to test the uh, analysis by coming into the market. Uh, we're going to be an additional supply so that if the rents, if we could make the rents work at two and a half, then it was very good. If th that was kind of like the low number. So did we you do a sensitivity analysis? And I know we didn't discuss that here in class, but sensitivity basically says uh, you can look at a range of inputs. So you could say, let's set our rents at three, but let me run my analysis at two and a half, 2.75, and maybe three and a quarter. And that's the way that you can test your pro forma, because perhaps at three, which is closer to where Amory is, in fact, you're above that, right. then maybe your IRRs would have been in the 20% range and you'd say, this might be a valuable or, or viable investment. Well, when we did, when we did, the, uh, when we did um, a composite uh, uh, square foot rental mm -hmm. analysis, it was around 2.8. I see. A composite. And, and then what we did was that we not only used Amory and Camden, those were the specific ones, but then once we got the composite of, of everything, we went through another four or six that we had in the area, and we were the low, we were on the low end, mm -hmm. but it was 30 cent difference. Okay, if I'm doing the math right, you're saying $2.50 per square foot per month for rental, correct? Yes. 12 months in a year, $30 per square foot. Right. Okay, $30 per square foot, and assuming Obviously, you wouldn't be able to rent out the entire floor plate of twelve thousand five hundred, but let's just say you did. That's three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars per floor times forty-two floors mm -hmm. would be fifteen million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of, of potential income. Right. Okay. Now, I am struggling to see how you would be able to get effectively a, a cash on cash return off of that $175 million investment of anything north of 10%. Uh, and you're right, and it doesn't. We will have to use 40% uh, equity okay. to get it to 13. Oh, and that's how you got your higher IRR. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work for any. Right. I didn't hear any discussion whatsoever about what sort of loan structure you have. Uh, yeah. They, they all are based on, and you're right, no, we did not get into that, but... So when was, we read your report, we'll be able to, to see that. Yeah, that part will be there. Okay, you said 40% equity, 60% debt? Yes. And what was your cost of debt? Cost of debt? What do you mean by that? Account? What's your interest rate on the debt? Seven and a half. And... I'm amortized by 30 years uh, on a 20-year uh, loan. Okay, so 30 year, 30 year amortization, 20 year term? Yes. Okay. And we had to do the same thing with every case, otherwise it wouldn't, right. uh, none of them would work. Yes, Susan. So you mentioned um, CoStar and Reese. Um, what other resources or databases did you use to support your outcome? Everything I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the usage went up? <laughs> Can you name specific anything? Do you have something else? Well, we used uh, Just look in your report. Did you cite the references at the end yeah. of your report? Uh, those are the uh, two sources that I can uh, okay. come up with. Okay. 
So I want to be mindful of our time because I want to give the uh, other group, of course, the opportunity to do that. I see the doctor is coming up with his calculation and while he's doing that, it'd be interesting to note, um, uh, you know, if I look at construction loans right now, and I don't know if it's perm or permanent or debt or construction loan, but it's interesting that you, why did you choose 7.5% interest rate? Conversations with a couple people, but there was nothing. Okay. It Fair seemed enough. like a middle of the road. Okay. I would, I would have expected the interest rate would have been probably five or below. Sure. In, in, in today's environment. And that could have a huge impact right. on your affordability uh, to run a deal like this. Okay. So are you coming up with a number or should we uh, just yeah, proceed? It would be nice. kind of tough to pass yeah. right now. All right. Great. Well, thank you, group. Uh, Carlisha, I want you to stay on the phone so we can at least hear the uh, other group's uh, information as well. Let's see. If oh, we great. I was hoping you'd say that. I was going to ask you if I could stay to hear the other group's Thank you. Um, so do you have a, a drive here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You could if you'd like. Are you sure? Are you still there? Yes, I am. <laughs> Excellent. Great. So, we've got you on the screen. Water. Oh, here we go. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Winston, Noah, Jesus, and Luis. Uh, we've done our presentation on Los Olas Deal, and uh, we're presenting ourselves as the premier group. So, you know, as everybody here is aware, uh, we were given a major project, which was Las Olas View. Um, we analyzed the offering memorandum and put our presentation together based on that. So we're going to go over a brief executive summary of the project. Uh, we'll move into site analysis, talk about the zoning, uh, the market in this location, concept plan comparables, SWOT analysis, go through the numbers and the financials, and then run into our conclusion. Well, <clears throat> about us, uh, we're the premier group. We're um, we're a company who who analyze uh, business uh, for our clients uh, to offer them the business for businesses. 
So here we have a, a project named Las Olas, which, which is a, a piece of land in, in downtown Florida. So we made an analysis of the project uh, through uh, Cosman and Wakefields, where the brokers were offering the, the, the property for sale. And then well, we, we did the analysis to offer it to, for our client. For our client. Okay. Yeah, it's important to know, you know that our team is made up of two real estate professionals, two construction professionals. Uh, Lewis has a lot of construction experience, such as myself. These two gentlemen, you know, really helped out in the real estate side of it. So we're hoping that we could, you know, you know, look through the information that was provided to us by Cushman and Wakefield, and kind of, you know, dig through their marketing and see, you know, is this true? Does it work? Is this the best use for the property? So you're going to notice that our presentation is based on building the Crocker Tower, but we've also done some rough back of the envelope numbers to see what else is going to work. Okay, so here we have the, the, the piece of land. The piece of land is located in downtown Fort Royal. And uh, Second Street, uh, Fort Royal Second Street, where the south, uh, the west side of the, of the US-1, uh, just south uh, the Broward Boulevard, and north to the Las Colas Boulevard, just here. So this, side, this location is the last piece of land uh, with this size in, in Fort Lauderdale, downtown Fort Lauderdale. And it is, uh, it is uh, there was a flood amendment in, in 2014, which, um, which has, um, uh, which led built a building of, uh, which led build a building of 425 high rise units, or 425,000 square feet office, plus uh, uh, 45,000 uh, square feet of retail and parking facilities. Now this this piece of land is empty. Uh, it's uh, it's asphalt and it's used uh, for parking lots. This piece of land uh, is zone R A C C R R A C C C. Let's, and, huh? let's let's talk about the zoning next. But let's look at something you know just kind of orientation wise when we're looking at the location of this physical site. You've got a couple of office towers right next to it. You've obviously got the Camden, which is already a apartment building, which you'll see in our comparables. Um, so, you know, like Jesus said, the location is excellent. Downtown Fort Lauderdale, largest piece of undeveloped land located, you know, with the best, most liberal zoning that you can ask for. Um, you know, physically, a couple things. We've got the asphalt lot. We couldn't find any information on any existing lease, you know, to, to, to analyze what type of revenue that's bringing in for right now. But we're sure that being an asphalt lot, there's some type of agreements in place between an office tower, the city, or something. It's probably generating some money. So, um, other than that, you can see we've got this little road here, easement, uh, which kind of cuts through it. Um, ideally, this piece of land would have been here, right? You know, where you're right off of the uh, main highway, but it's not so. Um, yeah. yeah, and this piece of land uh, it was uh, sold in 2006 for 14 million nine hundred dollars, and has a current tax basis of five million four hundred sixty-four thousand dollars. That was the price that you can see in Coastal and, and the Broward County. Okay, okay. Now the zoning and land use analysis uh, by reading uh, section 47.13.1 of the um, single for Florida land use code. Um, we can see that uh, the regional activities uh, city center is the most liberal and intense uh, zoning district in the whole city of Florida. Um, pretty much, uh, there's unlimited densities in retail, office, hotel, and residential uses. Commercial retail uses are required on the ground floor building on those streets where pedestrian activity is encouraged and as, a, as an incentive for developers there's no off-site there's no parking uh, there's no off off the street parking requirements uh, they are exempted however uh, city of Florida is granted a total of nine meter parking spaces in the easement to the east of the property now let's talk about the downtown master plan. In 2003, city of Fort Lauderdale saw an opportunity to expand and to, um, to change the, the city master plan because uh, they saw a rapid growth in, in city of Fort Lauderdale. So they um, 
established the, the downtown master plan with the idea of a making city of for Laurel a new urban center. And that brought a, a lot of development and new high rises and new um, architectural de design guidelines into city of Laurel, especially to, to the regional activity city center. Uh, moreover, uh, there's no high uh, restrictions on the on this zoning district. Uh, however, um, however, uh, the federal aviation administration have to approve every residential density per acre. Let's see, the plan was amended in December 10th, 2014. And the subject parcel, which is parcel A2, was restricted to 425 high rise units, uh, 425,500 square feet of office use, and 45,850 square feet of commercial use and party facilities. The, um, you know, we've mentioned the amended plat a couple times. So in 2014, the plat was amended. Before that, the previous plat was recorded in uh, 1990. Uh, we were able to obtain that through looking through the official records. So we went to the official records, pulled up the original plat, and basically I'm gonna go back a slide, but just so that you have an idea, the original plat for the mill, uh, you know, for this property was everything here. So in 1990, if you look at that plat, there's nothing on the land, you know, a bunch of easements. This road was already there in 1990. And then, you know, apparently in 2006, by looking through the county records, this property was sold for, um, I think, $14 million. Now, I think, uh, when was the Camden built? Uh, 2004. So the Camden was built in 2004, so that timing kind of coincides, right? You had an original plat in 1990, Camden was built in 2004, then it gets sold for 14 and a half million, and then in 2014, or 2013, right before the amended plat, it sells again for 6.7 million. And then they amend the plat to basically, you know, separate this from this, so now this is the parcel that we're looking at, A2. which they call A2, and this is A1. So just a little history for the for the plat there. So. And then uh, as part of the master plan, the, the new, uh, well, the master plan was amended. Check here, one second. The master plan was amended in 2007, and they came out with these new guidelines, uh, and strict wall, shoulder height, um, building is required for the frame street, three to nine floors, uh, it came out with a preferred maximum floor plate size of, of the tower portion, there won't, there, there won't be any uh, maximum floor plate for the first nine floors of building, and, and the rest, I just said it before. When looking at the offering memorandum that was provided by Cushman and Wakefield, you know, they had the original drawings for the Crocker Tower, 396 units, residential units. When we look through section 47 of the code, right, that talks about, you know, how many units, it specifically says that it's limited to 5,100 uh, dwelling units, you know, for the RACC or RACCC. So when you start adding up those numbers and you look through the pretty brochure they give you and you got all these buildings that are completed, these ones that are under construction, these ones are planned, you start adding those up. If we did decide to do this as an apartment building, we would exceed that 5,100. Now the code allows you to exceed that number, but you've got to meet certain requirements. So the offering memorandum gives us a lot of information, pretty pictures, but it doesn't really tell us there that now you've got to jump through some hoops to get your project approved. So on the surface, you look at it, you, you know, you think you probably have some design documents, maybe construction documents that you could kind of buy a deal and just start building a deal, but there's things that need to happen after that. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the different characteristics of the actual market. It's kind of small, so I'll try and break it down to you. Um, basically, the economic and demographic information I pulled from S3, who has a category of 67 um, segments, and it breaks down the socioeconomic uh, preferences and what they prefer to do. So the important things I took out is that there are three um, top groups and they're all about 20%. The highest being composing 21.8 and the lowest 19.7 of the top three, so it's pretty even there. Uh, it makes up 62.2% 
and those people do prefer renting, we analyze this property as a potential, you know, what Crocker had, and in our conclusion, you'll see something a little different. Um, so the categories that came about were laptops and lattes, which was the largest. They like to spend money. 75% uh, have a bachelor's degree or higher. And they spend money to maintain an image that they have. The other group was Metro Renters. Obviously, they like to rent, given the name. And 80% of those in that portion choose to rent. Uh, and the last was Trendsetters. And I'm going to kind of venture out and say this is almost like the millennial. They're very connected was the word that was used. Uh, always attached to their phone. Technology is major. And they prefer to spend money. They, a lot of them don't have vehicles. I think it's 36% don't have one vehicle. Um, and they choose to spend their money on higher end apartments. So. Okay, so with demand and supply, average occupancy, less Amory, which was completed this year of the apartments that we put as comparables, uh, was 96%. Uh, a recent article in The Real Deal mentioned that rental rates in downtown Fort Lauderdale had actually increased about 8%. I think that was... And that Real Deal article was from uh, Marcus and Milchap, uh, right? Yes, from Marcus and Milchap. I think that was produced about three or four days ago. Um, so it's up 8% year over year. Uh, I talked about a couple, and you'll read it in the paper, but talked about a couple, I guess, things that are driving this. One of them being that 8.3% uh, is the increase in the median uh, multifamily home value. So some people are being priced out. And then the average price has actually gone up 2.3%. And that is, as of August, that was the latest statistical data we had for that. And that's in the um, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm Beach, I'm okay. So our target market is the young professional, the renter, the laptops and lattes, metro renters, trendsetters. Um, young professionals, aspiring executives. The three biggest employers in the area, and this was actually pulled from COSAR, what I did is I pulled all the properties around the subject site, pulled a one mile radius, and used that data. So uh, the highest was scientific and technology, which fits perfect. There's um, 1,925 businesses that, are, that fall into that category. The next was finance and insurance, which there were 464. This is all within a one mile radius. And the third highest was healthcare and social assistance with 433 businesses. Okay, so the market trends, um, although it was incentivized, you know, no mandatory parking, there was a 2015 poll by the National Multifamily Housing Council and they interviewed 120, I want to say it's 120 executives for different groups. And it was the NMHC Kingsley Apartment Rental Preferences, I believe, is the title. And uh, the number one amenity was parking for everyone. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, the second was a pool, third was a fitness center. And I should also mention that each of the three segments identified as the top segment are all living active lifestyles. Well, not all, but the majority live active lifestyles. Um, secure community access was fourth, and recycling was fifth, but this is nationwide. So they also had a segment about locale and how there are different preferences in different areas of the, of the country, and Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach our amenity of choice specific to our location was a party room, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, so another question they asked, which I thought was appropriate in the kind of the younger demographic, I think that 
median age is 39.6. 98% um, of the respondents said that cell phone reception was extremely important. Not quite an amenity, but we'll also get into the communications in a little bit. Um, and another thing with your biblical dogs is pet owners. So there was a high demand for um, dog parks and a community dog wash. The community dog wash was 54%. I think the dog dog park was like 67%. I'm trying to remember this. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, looking at the market and the trends, and I, I think some of the things we've covered in class, I mean, you know, there is a general, you know, you know, there's a need for rental space. So uh, people are moving more towards renting. So, you know, they gave us some plans which offered a, you know, luxury rental community. So that's what we analyzed. So they, so we feel there is a demand there. So if you're just taking the money aside, which we'll cover the money next, uh, there is a demand for rental. So. Okay, so with concept plan, uh, Southeast 2nd Street is a Crocker's partner uh, entity, and Crocker's states that they specialize in Class A office, uh, and they do have mixed use as well. But uh, after talking to Troy, I asked him, I said, why is it that you guys are getting healthy? Or why is it that you're marketing this now? It was owned by Crocker. He said, well, Crocker is doing another project which is actually adjacent to this one. It's a 15-story office project. And essentially, they wanted to stick to Class A. So we kind of, Ben and I were having a discussion, and we were talking about, well, are there any other reasons that this is happening this way? And we thought, potentially, like you were saying this morning, they might have been taking it through the process getting the maximum feasible conceptual design and brokering the deal off because now that this has been approved, anything lesser should be a little bit easier for the next end yeah. user. Go, go, going back to your chart, which you've showed us like three times over the past few classes, I mean, you're creating your value up front and there's a lot of risk and a lot of cost that gets incurred once you start construction. So these, you know, they can make their money now. Why take the risk? Why spend the cost? You got to raise the capital. You got to get the money. You got to take on that risk. You got to build a 42 story high rise right in the middle of downtown Fort Lauderdale. It's not for everybody. I think it's important to note as well that under acquisition strategy on their website, on the Crocker Partners website, it says buy low, add value, sell high. Exactly. <laughs> Are you sure that is what's up? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> Okay, so the comparables, uh, we use Camden, Amory, and View New River. Okay, so this is pretty much the breakdown. View was completed last year, 209 units. They're the only ones without a studio, but they're 97% occupied. Camden, obviously we have to use that, it's adjacent. And, I, and I'll tell you why I didn't use a couple other ones as well. Um, so Camden's adjacent, 420. They have the studios to the three bedrooms, 96%. Here's uh, here's some quick math, a little bit of spreadsheet, so Fred can start taking a look at it now. Oh, that is Already have. Yeah. View uh, View New River, like Noah said. Um, Camden uh, didn't really use the numbers from Amaro, right? Right, because in the OM it said they were 25% leased. Um, didn't have the accurate numbers as to where they were leased at, so. They don't want to follow up their projections and use them as a comparable when they weren't even. We, we actually called them as well and they wouldn't release any of that information to us. So we couldn't get updated information. You could have just called Jessica. She might have given you them. <laughs> so basically some quick numbers here on the New River. Um, they give you their own numbers in the OM, but uh, we put them in here too. Mm -hmm. So you've got the unit breakdown, uh, the typical size, and then the per square footage numbers. The way we got the per square footage numbers was based off of their information. So they gave us some square footage for different ones, and we kind of extrapolated that these would be reasonable, uh, you know, 
gave us our potential gross income. Hopefully, you can read that back there. You know, say, can we put a turn a light off, maybe? Um, yeah. Can you just get in yes. that will help. Yeah. Is that better? Not really. It's no. too small. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's. I had to. Here we go. Can you read that? Well, your potential gross income is six point seven million dollars, and your what's your actual average returns coming in at? Uh, I don't have the average returns. Have, I have the average returns. Okay, that's not. The we'll keep going. We'll, we'll figure it out. So yeah, basically, um, we've got that going on. Didn't put in any other income. I mean, there's obviously always laundry facilities and you know potential of running out of ballroom or something, but I don't have any of that in here. Uh, figured it at five percent vacancies and collections. Uh, the brochures state that the vac you know vacancies are less, but we decided to go a little bit more conservative. So gave us an effective gross income, and then total operating expenses. Without knowing, we just figured at thirty percent. Uh, I mean, you've got your management fees, you've got you, you know your building stuff. So and you chose thirty percent based on based on uh, you know made a couple calls and somebody said you know hey it could be anywhere from you know high twenties to like mid thirties. Probably could have done that a little bit better. I'm sure you'll let us know how. Uh, but that's generally a, a decent number, and if your resources were reliable, then it's a good enough number. And then uh, that gives us a net operating income. Uh, so then we applied a market cap rate to I'm kind of. Can you read off that number? I can't see it. All right. Yeah, so potential gross income six point seven one four million. Yep. They get into the collection at five percent. Gives us an EGI of six point three seven nine. Yep. 30% total operating expenses. Gives us an NOI of 4.465. Okay. And then um, for the other one, for the Camden, uh, we had a potential gross of 9.935. 5% vacancies and collections, which gives us an effective of 9.438. 30% total operating expenses. Gives us an NOI of 6.607. All right, so your NOI is 4.465. What cap rate could you apply? 5.5%. And why'd you choose that? Uh, no one? Yeah, I can tell you. Um, Great. So we actually, in doing the apartments, we pulled up, and I think I have on because our, our paper's 71 pages, so we didn't want to endage you with ridiculousness. But uh, in the downtown market, some of the mixed use, and I believe actually Flagler, is it Manor or Flagler? But I, I excluded those comps because they're more garden style. One of them was actually just sold, I'm sure you know that. Um, so we kind of pulled it from what's been selling, what the cap rate has been selling it. I had also Fort Lauderdale, Flagler. Also Aaron. done some Google searches and found a, uh, found a CBRE report talking about multifamily uh, cap rates. Um, and they said, uh, if I remember correctly, anywhere from 5 to 6%. So yeah, it's probably in the right market range. So uh, and based on the number of units, what's your price per unit? About four and change? Um, 413586 okay. for the view. Mm -hmm. And then 312000 for the Canton. All right. So basically, that gives us an estimated uh, value of the cash flows. And then we need to add in the value of the property. Mm -hmm. Gives okay. us a total value. So. One of the things that we looked at when analyzing it is, okay, so we're gonna get into the development cost next. Am I gonna spend it to develop it or am I just gonna buy a building? So so what would you attribute that $100,000 difference per unit cost to be between those two projects? Well, one of them's 2004, another's 2015. Okay. So, okay. you know, the rents aren't gonna be right. as high. They're actually redoing Camden, Las Olas Camden right is uh, Camden is a mid-rise. Yep. Uh, View New River is a high-rise. Yep. Uh, Camden is an older. Huh? Yep. It's about a dollar difference. I can't quite read it. About a dollar difference. You ask the question. Point. Move on. Yeah, okay. Keep going. That's good. Um, I think we should also mention. I called someone over at American Tower. We were talking about how do we generate additional cash flows. We'll get into that when, yeah. when we look at yeah. the. Uh, That's good. Okay. okay now I'm going to be talking about the SWOT analysis. Right. Uh, we did the SWOT analysis based on whether or not this project makes se makes sense and, and based on the strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, witnesses and mm -hmm. threats and opportunities on about this project. So I'm, I'm going to start by the, the strengths. Of course, location is uh, one of the most important things. Uh, uh, Las Olas View is located at the regional activity city center of downtown Fort Lauderdale. What that makes the project very attractive. 
uh, is close by the I-95, I-95, and in near proximity to or Everglades and uh, for lower than Hollywood International Airport. And then we have, uh, we also um, took, a, uh, took a look to a strong apartment demand. As you can see, like uh, many new home buyers are not buying homes right now, they're more uh, into renting because, uh, I mean, the market has changed. It, it, it's pretty hard right now to get a a mortgage, a, a home mortgage, and also we found that uh, the millennials are trending more into, into living in the urban center. So, or oh wait, um, I didn't oh. finish. Then we have the strong downtown uh, CBD. Many uh, tenants coming from plantations, Sunrise, Deerfield Beach, Hollywood, uh, and many others are coming to the downtown uh, CBD because it's, it's, it's becoming very attractive and rents are not very expensive. Okay, so to the witnesses. On the witnesses we have, um, when we did our development cost, we realized that uh, the development cost was going to be very expensive, uh, above $100 million. So we took that uh, as a weakness because uh, you know you have to realize that it's a lot of money. Uh, um, Big over risk. Overruns can you know be extremely, uh, uh, extremely you know um, harmful for a project itself. Then we have the uh, securing equity and financing. Uh, I mean it's a big deal. Uh, what is the probability that we're going to raise the, you know, the, the right private equity and getting the, the right financing at, at the right at the right time? Uh, if and also if someone hasn't done it before, why? Um, I mean, there's things we have to analyze more in deep in order to make sure uh, this project is uh, perfect. And then we have the, the fierce competition. Is RAC uh, downtown Fort Lauderdale? Competition is extremely aggressive. We have George Paris Knight right next to us building things that uh, Icon that's all us, right? Um, so we have to bring the right product, the right uh, rent prices, the right amenities, and the right um, the right uh, design, and architectural design into a project so we can um, occupy the, the building until we reach uh, an stabilized occupancy rate. Okay, opportunities. Um, okay, this site is obviously the last remaining undeveloped site in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Um, it's going to be a, an extremely great opportunity for any developer who wants to be part of this uh, a great project. Um, then we have a then there's a substantial increase in residential population in, coming into downtown, which can uh, you know help us reach a, a stabilized occupancy faster uh, and also we have future developments coming to them downtown for oil such as the bright line uh, passenger railway that is going to benefit uh, approximately 50 million passengers uh, that are uh, located uh, within the Miami area for oil area and, and the Orlando area I would like to mention that, uh, you know, Miami and Fort Lauderdale are separate, but uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with uh, Brickell and the Epic, the lot right next to the Epic, one acre sold for like 100 million. This isn't Brickell, this isn't the Epic, but it kind of gives you an idea as to what, you know, the real estate, you know, is trading for, for such a small site. I mean, we're at 1.55 and, and kind of just a little sidebar, but it's, you can pretty much build whatever you want here. Um, you know, height-wise, assuming the FAA let you so. Okay, and then we have the then we have the threats. Um, of course, uh, commercial real estate uh, developments are very complex and risky uh, business. So the market conditions can change at any time, and it's very important to uh, do a second market study before. Um, we actually start uh, building the, 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 the building structure to make sure, because uh, let's say we want to market the building for rent. If we 
uh, do a second market analysis and we find that it makes more sense to do condominiums than rentals, then we have to, I guess, convert the building. Um, and another threat is the risk of oversupply. We don't want to be in that uh, situation where where we, fi uh, we get the uh, certificate of occupancy when we have a, 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 a label that is called a hyperinflation uh, by Glenn Miller. Because if we uh, finish building at that point, then obviously uh, we won't reach the adequate or appropriate uh, occupancy rate to pay debt service. And then we have the raising interest rates. Um, they, they can be low right now in that market, but who knows if that's going to change and that, that can affect or refinance in, in the future or or permanent, or permanent financing. Yeah. And new competitors, uh, we can be building you know, the, the best building on that side, but competition can be extremely difficult uh, in the near future if, if someone else comes with a better idea. I'm going to speed it up here. I know we're kind of tight on time. Uh, quick financial analysis back of the envelope. Um, hopefully you can read that. Can you read that, Fred? No? Nope. Nope. Hit the lights. No, nope, it's not going to help. Okay, so basically uh, we looked at the apartment building. You looked at the spreadsheet we did before, but just a quick kind of, you know, back of the envelope. You know, you're in a restaurant. You're trying to figure out the numbers. 247 a square foot, 379,245 rentable square feet gives you an NOI, or I'm sorry, a PGI. Uh, we figured some other uh, income, retail plus communications lease, 245. What Noah was saying before is, um, you know, he knows some people that are into the business of leasing tower space. We're gonna be building a tall tower. We figured we can get some additional revenues, which I think was like $200,000. That is the cost to build on top of the high rise. About 150 to 200. A good amount of money. Three to four at 2,000 a month. So vacancies and collections 5% gives us an EGI of 10.9. Total operating expenses at 33%, similar to what we did before. Went a little bit more conservative because we're doing it on the back of an envelope. Um, NOI 7.3, cap rate 5%. Valuation of the cash flow is 146. Um, and then the value of the land, we had it 7 million. And how did you estimate that and why? Uh, we went to the county records. Uh, we saw what the previous land sale was. It sold for $6.3 million. And why would that matter? Um, I guess it really doesn't matter. But, I mean, no, you're no. only going to pay at any given time what, you know, what the land's worth, right? It has no. no relationship to the deal, does it? Um, it's got a relationship if I can get it for that much. So if you're doing, <laughs> this, is, this is a back of the envelope front door or back door? Well, this right here would be the front door. So you're ta you're 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 trying to to solve for the value of the land, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, you're right. Got me. Just asking. <laughs> okay. Keep going. So I came up with a total uh, valuation and an anticipated IRR of uh, twelve point nine. Now, how would you come up with an IRR on this static analysis? Well, you don't hear. That's why I told you have some spreadsheets but it would have been very small if I would have put it in as small as it already is now. I understand. Okay, keep going. So, uh, then we did a brief one. I think everybody can read this one. We can read this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, condominium building sales revenues based on $550 a square foot. And I have all the data to support. Okay, I can cool. cool. 62 there. properties no of sales in the last 12 months. So, okay. uh, it says rentable but saleable. So 208 million total expenses. I assumed it at 10 percent, right? You've got your broker's fees and commissions, um, which obviously aren't that much. I mean, sure. they're 3 percent. But I figured there's other stuff I didn't really know about. So wanted to be safe, 10 percent. Do you think that's safe? Or yes, it is. That's okay. a good number. Uh, gross revenues 187 million. Cost of development 125 million. And where do you get the 125 from? Um, well, we figured, well, that's on the spreadsheet, but we figured $160 uh, per construction cost. That doesn't cover development, but I have it on the spreadsheet. So what I did for the spreadsheets is uh, I found a useful toolkit on the ULI website. I know you're a board member of the ULI. ULI Developers Toolkit. It's got a bunch of spreadsheets uh, similar to what we go over in Fred's class. A very basic starting off spreadsheet, you know, where you figure out your NOI and then you kind of work, work your way up. Okay. So and, and the but your inputs are from where? That's what I'm curious. Oh, about. the inputs are from me. So it's oh, because you're in construction. Yeah. There we go. Okay, great. Um, financial analysis. I don't think you can read that. This is the snapshot from the spreadsheets. I'll open it up real quick if I have a chance here. But uh, mm -hmm. this is the first spreadsheet that's part of that uh, rental and sales revenue summary. It's 
It's got the amount of units that we looked at before, additional income, the retail space, and it gives you a total uh, revenue. The pro forma NOI, again, you can't read it, so sorry about that. No, um, we can see that. It says $7.4 million, or oh, 7.6. Great. Yeah. So, so, so something I figured we should add real quick. He mentioned ICOM. Um, ICOM was all says going to say. So at first, they were vacillating on whether or not they're going to do condos or apartments. They said they were going to do condos, and they said they were going to do apartments. Now they stated they are going to be condominiums. So that may play into this as well. They may have done the same study or same basis for their study, and that's what you know what that was talking but about. But did you look at any condo comparables in yes. that yes. yes. Okay. I have all. Uh, maximum debt calculation, don't think you can read that, maybe you can, so it's just the next spreadsheet that kind of populates from what you'll do before. Sure. Um, and then the development costs, so this is the important thing that you were just asking about, how did you come up with these Great. numbers? I see it. So this stuff was mostly pre-populated, you, know, um, you know, stuff like that. I obviously added the construction cost. I modified some of these which were kind of out of whack. I mean the construction costs in there I think were like at 10%, but okay. have been astronomical. I know that the you know, the, I mean, the architect and engineering, I know it's not that much. No, that's fine. So that kind of, that's how I came up with the 124, 743, rounded up. Mm -hmm. So. And then, uh, and finally, the conclusion. So, um, we did, I mean, we, when we uh, finished this uh, whole um, study on, on, the, on the project, we realized that, um, that spending more than a hundred million dollars on this project just to make seven million dollars in NOI it's not very worth it uh, we want to we would like to continue this project uh, as long as we can do uh, uh, condominiums sell condominiums uh, we have uh, the, the comparables and the net absorption rates of the condominiums and uh, not here but some um, the study and we pretty much uh, found that you know that Miami is becoming a very uh, expensive place where people uh, don't want to spend that much money into condominiums anymore and, and they are uh, pretty much um, uh, taking a look to Broward County because it's you're getting the same quality or cheaper price so that's what really we realized in, in, in the conclusion we, we can uh, build this building and sell condo apartments and actually make way more money than by renting. And what was your sale price for your condominium? Uh, we have five hundred fifty dollars a square foot. Okay. Yeah. Which right. is actually oh, it's around the last all this grand pricing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Which we had anywhere from five hundred to like six something. We went right in the middle with five fifty. Okay, so that's right on target. For I think the River House is like five. Right. So just right just five. curious where you so those are older. Um, okay. I, I don't know if we have some time. I'll open up the spreadsheet. Sure. Real quick. See if you can do that. That might be beneficial. I assume that you met with, well, I know you met with Troy Ballard and you yep. had a meeting, so he provided some of this information as well to you? Or some of it's in the offering memorandum. Right. Um, and we also called to confirm some of the pricing and went on their websites. They have the different floor plans, the pricing. Okay. Yeah, we actually went to downtown to meet with him in person. Yes, I know. He called and told me. Yep. So that's what. So uh, I applaud that. That's very good. That's what we got going on here. So basically, uh, that populates into this spreadsheet, which is the uh, pro forma NOI, mm -hmm. right? It brings that over. You add the vacancy, effective gross income, 
Um, we put in some factors in here for property management costs. Uh, that I actually had to look up, you know, typical property management costs for, and uh, I don't remember why I used 5%, but I found something to substantiate that. Uh, controllable costs, 1500 per unit. I mean, uh, you know, maintenance stuff. I mean, it's more of a reserve for, for things that you're going to have to take care of. Um, and then insurance and stuff. Uh, there's nothing behind the insurance and the utilities other than me guessing, so don't ask me where I got it. Mm -hmm. And then the debt calculation, very important, right? How are we going to pay for this? Uh, uh, how are we going to pay for this? Fred was asking before what the debt structure was, so. So each tab rolls to the next, so we yep. roll to our cash flows, okay. Yeah, 5.75 um, interest rate over 20 years, LTV of 75%. Uh, gives you a maximum loan amount of 103, but then you've got your debt coverage ratio of 1.2. Uh, so that's going to dictate how much you can borrow. So even though with the LTV it says 103, you can really only go to 75. Fair enough. Do you guys have any questions? No, keep rolling. Okay. Um, this kind of rolls into the next spreadsheet, which is uh, probably one of the more important ones, mm -hmm. uh, which is the cost. How much is it going to cost uh, to build this thing? So you've got the amount of units up there. You've got the, um, you've got the square footage. And did you just adjusted the units because I remember it said 425. You just changed it to uh, uh, from what was in the approved plan. Um, no, it was it 396, was but then there's some retail spaces. So that's oh, I see. That's correct. Okay. So I figured some retail spaces on the ground floor. I think it was four or five units, so 396 plus. All right. Um, land cost, uh, approval fees. Uh, these, these are all line items that were in there. Um, love to tell you that I kind of created this from scratch and I kind of thought through each one of these. I'm sure there's, uh, there's a lot of other things that could have been added or adjusted, but the big things here are the construction costs, $150 a square foot of hard construction. Um, but are all those numbers your inputs? Though? Yes, well, yes, the construction costs, the remediation, approval, uh, the land, yeah, basically everything there. That Why did you use 12 million for the land costs there, but yet you said in your earlier in your presentation it was seven million dollars. Right. For your I didn't change it on the other spreadsheet, so um, I had originally used that number, um, and then you know throughout putting the finishing touches, I didn't coordinate. And, and once price. again, Troy gave you guidance, which is, which is Troy interesting. Troy told us they were trying to sell it for fourteen. To he said they were trying to sell it for fifteen. Yeah. Right. So we went a little bit lower than that. I mean, he's trying mm -hmm. to sell us a pretty picture. Um, and so the real benefit, of course, and, and, and this is the challenge that we face here, uh, and you know, brokers, and, and Troy Ballard is an excellent broker, uh, and he's going to give guidance as any good broker would, and so our challenge for everybody, whichever team we're on here, is that we want to make sure that you, as real estate development professionals, solve for the likely costs, and just as you saw in our example before, then if you can figure out what the values are, then you can make the decision at some point, and that's why the benefit is, these are great spreadsheets to use from you alive, but then you go back to the, or go to the front door, back door analysis and see, does it click? And then you may say, hey, maybe it is six, seven, or whatever it is, and that's where you can begin the negotiation, and yeah, understand the delta. Yeah, this kind of helps us see some of the finer points, like the front door and back door is very important, but it's got a big part in there, right? Like what's the cost? This helps us kind of see the different components that are broken sure. down into the development cost. Because I know construction costs and I can say, hey, let's put you know, 150, 160 bucks a square foot. But all these other things that we may not have exposure to as, you know, getting into the development field, this helped us see some of the other things we need to carry in for marketing, you know, architectural and engineering, taxes during construction insurance. Yes, I think that's like correct. That. So that's that's kind of it. I think we've run out of time. So. Well, I mean, I, I can sit here until anybody comes in the next class. So <laughs> what is your recommendation then? You chose to basically say this is, I just want to hear it again. Our, yeah, our recommendation is not to build apartment complex, uh, not to build luxury apartments uh, on this property, uh, to utilize it for condo uh, or a mixed use. And to acquire it for what price? For what? And how much would you bid or acquire this well, price for? According to our spreadsheet here, twelve million dollars. I and see. I would also like to say we were conservative with five fifty square foot. Um, 
it's not in the same region, it's northeast Fort Lauderdale, but there's one and a half billion dollars going on currently in what they're deeming North Beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also, Riva's got a project uh, on Middle River there. So I think Oceanland's got some, they're saying prices reached 900, 950 a square foot, that's with water, but you know, it's important to know there's a huge spread in there depending on finishes and things of those. We like, we like the location, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we think it's got an excellent location as compared to some Class A office space. Uh, you know, the future transportation component. We think that condos. You know, and you wrote that all up in your executive summary and your conclusions and recommendations? I think so. I'll be interested in reading that then. Thank you. Any questions from the rest of the jury? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Please. Um, so in the SWOT analysis, you talk about um, demographics being a strength and, and under opportunities you have an increase in the residential population. Where'd you get that? 7.51% within a one mile radius. And that was based yeah, on. Yeah, that's based on. Uh, that's, sorry, that's the projected oh. growth of 7.51 from 2016 to 2021. Okay. That's from CoStar. Okay. Um, I have the census. Actually, it's the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau as well. Okay. Which it was actually a larger growth there. I don't remember that number off the top of my head. But I do know it was larger than 7.51. Okay. And then my other question is, so you come up at the end, and this part of my ignorance on this. So the whole time you've been talking about rentals and the people, the groups, the laptops and lattes and that, those groups of people that would live there. And then you talk going, who are renters, and then you go into condos. So I kind of have a disconnect there for, my, for me. Okay. So well, we originally are... <laughs> Yeah, we originally we just, so who's gonna rent? So who's gonna buy yeah, the yeah, we, yeah, we decided it's it's a good question. Our presentation didn't address you know who's gonna buy it. I mean, we did our presentation based on the offering memorandum, which is a book about this thick that gives you pretty pictures. So we figured let's use that information and analyze what they're trying to sell us. They're trying to sell us this pretty picture. It's a nice brochure. So that's the way we structured it. Um, given the numbers that we came up with for the condos, we think it's viable. We're gonna have to do something similar this whole presentation to analyze to see if that's right you know market you know who's going to buy these what's the supply but just on the surface kind of rough numbers so far we, we feel that, that there's an opportunity so there. far we know that there's a, a revival in the condominium market before Florida that's why we see an opportunity for condo apartments in that area but we still have to as Ben says the research Okay, we can't I ignore 38% of the population. So, no, but, 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 but Susan raises an interesting point. I, doing an, an echo demo on an apartment market can be very different than looking at the slice yes. for, for sale and, and condominiums. So I, I applaud the effort on the, the rental market, but just be so careful that then saying, oh, but you know, my numbers don't work, and let's look at condo, then you'd have to really do the same thing again. Right. We, and, and we know that we have to do the same exact thing, but That's we also right. recognize that 38%, which is a huge amount as well, can't be ignored. So I have the data and I attached it as an exhibit that shows the actual sales increases in the multifamily, the price, like I said, 2.3 no. appreciation, or sorry, average selling price increase year over year. So it can't be ignored. Any more comments, sir? I'm good. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And uh, there we have it. All right. Gentlemen, appreciate it. Carla, thank you from the sky. We have our class.